Okay. So as Anne said, um, this is meant to be a community conversation. Uh, we were given 10 minutes each to talk and um, uh, we'll field questions at the end, but please don't hesitate to interrupt us as well. Uh, that won't bother us at all. Um, so I was given three topics to cover in 10 minutes. The middle one, I can quite assure you, you could go to a one week conference on and not, and not uh, cover the whole thing. So, so the purpose really is to hopefully generate some interest and some questions uh, in the audience. I was asked to cover these topics because I am the physician in the, uh, in the group and, and they are, uh, I guess, physician related uh, topics. Now, I don't know in the group here who remembers basic health class, but this is a picture of an ear, and uh, this is obviously the outside part, which is called the pinna and the ear canal, and then you've got an eardrum and some little bones appearing, and um, you've got an inner ear. In your inner ear, you have uh, two basic structures. You have an inner ear balance mechanism and an inner ear uh, hearing mechanism. The uh, snail-like structure there here is the uh, hearing part and the balance part are these, these canals. They're called uh, semicircular canals. So aging hearing, as I said, I'm just gonna make some, some basic points about this. Uh, and I, I would like to start by saying it's not normal for you to lose hearing as you age. I regularly see people uh, in their 80s and occasionally in their 90s with uh, still well-preserved good hearing in the normal range. So to sit at home with poor hearing and, and not consider any kind of help, uh, I would suggest to you is probably not what you, what you want to be doing. Um, Speech discrimination, uh, let me explain that. It's really the earliest uh, problem you notice with your hearing. And, and the word, or, or the two words mean uh, you lose your ability to discriminate the tones that make up a word so that the tones become blurred so that the word uh, becomes blurred. And at 55, I know I have a little bit of this, but probably still have a relatively good looking uh, hearing test. Um, and, and so fall sounds like call, sounds like ball, sounds like mall, and was it fall or call or ball, or I heard it, but I didn't quite make it out. And that's really when you're starting to have a little bit of, of a decline in your hearing. And that gets significantly worse at the Christmas party. So there are 25 people in the room like this, except they're all talking. 
the, their, their Christmas carols going, uh, the choo-choo train is going around on the Christmas tree, and that person is two or three feet in front of you, and you're looking at them like, I heard what they're saying, but I'm not sure I quite make that out. And that's early nerve uh, hearing loss. Um, most hearing in... <laughs> Most hearing in um, older people is either an aging or a decline with age in hearing or uh, noise induced. And certainly in an area like this where we've got a lot of, um, a lot of industry, there are people who have, who have had a fair bit of noise exposure that can contribute to deterioration in their hearing. And then of course, we live uh, in a hunt hunting and shooting culture and a lot of noise exposure uh, can contribute to, to decrease in hearing. And then, of course, as the noise exposed people age, they get a combination of the two. Uh, and those would be the two most common causes that we would see for a decreased uh, hearing. Some of you uh, may be surprised to find out that the rate at which your hearing ages is, at least for some people, in their genes. And I saw a lady at 2 o'clock this afternoon who was 82 years old and she had had hearing aids for the last 15 years and her brother and sister had had the same from about the same, uh, from about the same age. Not necessarily, but it, it, it can run in families. And, the, and I would also like to say, and I hear this regularly and I'm sure Barb does as well, uh, I'm too old to get hearing aids. After all, I'm almost dead. Well, you know, I say to these people, I am not a life insurance agent, but you're on one blood pressure medication, you're 86 years old, and you probably have a life expectancy of 10 years at that point, maybe at least. And, and it's really a lifestyle or a quality of life uh, issue to, uh, you know, try and maximize the hearing you've got, and I would encourage people to consider uh, some help. Now, as I mentioned, aging balance, that's a, that's a big topic. And I am, again, only just hoping to generate a little bit of conversation uh, only. I would start by telling people that even uh, mental issues or psychiatric issues can generate uh, instability or poor balance, dementia, and depression. And even just the anxiety, the fear of falling can make uh, older people feel uh, unstable. Uh, heart problems, abnormal ry rhythms of the heart so you don't perfuse your brain and it makes you lightheaded and poor circulation from blocked uh, arteries. Of course, orthopedic uh, problems change your gait and can contribute to falls and instability, arthritis, uh, joint problems, uh, the weakness and decreased range of motion of, uh, of your joints and you just don't quite get that foot up over the curb and you trip and, you trip and fall. Of course, neurologic issues like strokes uh, uh, that contribute to altered muscle strength and tone and altered reflexes, tremor, Parkinson's disease being the most common uh, one, altered brain function from things like strokes. And of course, then there are altered nerve sensation, um, principally in your feet. The most common cause of that would be diabetes, where people get altered sensation and therefore uh, have some instability and have trouble uh, maintaining balance. Goes without saying that if you can't <coughs> see, uh, it gets pretty hard sometimes to maintain your balance and tripping and falling is, uh, is easier and, and is also if you can't hear. Now, um, partly because it's uh, what we're talking about tonight, vestibular problems means inner ear problems and I'll touch on the most common inner ear uh, diagnosis uh, in a moment. Um, increased weight, weed, pardon me, weight or obesity certainly uh, makes it more difficult to maintain balance. Of course, medications, either new medications or if you've had a change in the dosage of your blood pressure medication and your blood pressure runs a little bit too low at times, um, abuse of prescription drugs and of course abuse of non-prescription drugs can contribute to falls in older people and uh, alcohol. And I stop there. That list and, you know, could go on and on and on. I don't think it's fair to say that anything that affects you physically or mentally can increase your fall risk, but certainly many things can. Many of the people who have trouble uh, have more than one diagnosis. 
uh, at least 75 to 80 percent of people, if you look at their fall risk, are going to have more than one problem uh, contributing uh, to their risk of falls. Okay, so now we're getting, as an ear, nose, and throat doctor, you're getting into something that I am uh, more expert in, and um, this is a vestibular illness, and this is called BPV or uh, BPPV, uh, and I have patients coming in telling me they have rocks in their head or stones in their ears. Perhaps the most common uh, description is they've heard that their crystals are out of place, and that's perhaps the most appropriate description of uh, the problem and what happens is that some naturally occurring crystals in your inner ear uh, they are supposed to be there but they become broken off and they start floating around in your balance mechanism and they float into a position in your balance mechanism where they're not supposed to be and you put your head back into a certain position and it starts bumping up against uh, some of the sensory fibers in your balance mechanism and start stimulating it and it's abnormal stimulation and in your inner ear that generates what's called vertigo and vertigo means an illusion of movement of yourself or the surroundings around yourself and so you get a spinning feeling and occasionally sometimes uh, some nausea associated with that and you move your head out of the position and the stimulation stops and it, and it goes away. So, um, we're all old enough here to talk about textbooks and not the internet, but so the textbook would say that when you go to get, get into bed at night and you extend your, your neck and put your head back on the pillow, you spin and uh, take your head out of the position and, and it goes away. You're changing the oil in the car, you're going to get something off the top shelf at the grocery store and looking up. Sometimes it occurs when you're, you're bending over. The, the wonderful thing about this problem is we can actually do something about it. I, I can't necessarily uh, fix your stroke, I can't reverse your arthritis, but uh, we can, through a relatively simple uh, head manipulation, take those crystals out of the part of the ear where they're bothersome and put them back into the part of the ear where they're supposed to be and um, and not so bothersome. So again, the really nice part about that is, is I, and more importantly the patient, gets a relatively uh, instant gratification of, of fixing that part of their, uh, their balance problem. And I have a little uh, video that shows that a little bit. It's just one minute long. Benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, also known as BPPV, is one of the most common causes of dizziness. There are two types of balance organs in the inner ear, the semicircular canals and the otolith organs. The otolith organs contain crystals of calcium carbonate, which are constantly being shed, dissolved, and replaced by new ones. If too many crystals fall off at one time, and the patient looks up or lies down before they dissolve, they can fall into one of the semicircular canals. When the patient rises, they don't fall out, they fall in and become trapped in the canal. Upon lying down, the crystals fall through the canal, causing an intense spinning that lasts a few seconds until the crystals fall to the lowest point. When rising, the crystals fall in the other direction, which again triggers dizziness. Until the crystals are <laughs> dissolved, the canal may not work properly and chronic disequilibrium as well as positional vertigo may be present. This will continue until the crystals in the canal dissolve or are moved out of the canal with special exercises or maneuvers. Even untreated, most cases of BPPV resolve within 14 days. Who's next?
multitask. Thank you for coming here today. I would like to introduce you to or perhaps refresh your memory about having a hearing test and then um, talk more about vestibular testing that we offer. As you saw previously, there's a diagram of the ear and the hearing loss and dizziness, those centers are in the purple area, the semicircular canals or the inner ear structure, the cochlea that's shaped like the seashell or the snail. When you come for a hearing assessment, it's important to bring a friend, a spouse, a son or a daughter. So don't feel that you have to go this alone because having someone there with you will help you get the most out of that experience. Perhaps you don't realize what you're not hearing and that person, your communication partner, could bring some things uh, to that appointment so that you could benefit the most from your hearing test. Often we use self-assessment scales and you have some on the handout there. Uh, self-assessment will let you rate your hearing problem as to how much certain things bother you. For example, do you have difficulty hearing the television or do you have difficulty hearing when someone speaks in a whisper? If you had someone with you, they would point out that you may have difficulty hearing someone speak in a whisper and you would have missed that. You would have just thought that nobody whispered to you. So having that self-assessment brings about some topics for conversation so that the audiologist can help address all of the problem areas for you. When you have a hearing test, which you may remember um, having at a doctor's office or I do see some patients that say they haven't had a hearing test since school. So the hearing test that we are most familiar with would be the one where we listen for tones and then respond to the tone. And many people would say, well, I have, a, I have an okay ability to hear those tones, but I have difficulty understanding what people say. And that made me think that maybe people don't realize that we test the speech understanding also. So the audiogram that is on the screen there will show you that's where we record the hearing test. And your scores would be considered better hearing if they were lower. So zero would be perfectly normal and going down the scale from green down to purple would be meaning that you had more hearing loss. Conversation takes place approximately in the middle. Going across the graph from uh, left to right would be the pitch of the tones that you heard. On the next slide there, it's an audiogram that shows normal hearing. So the red line at the top where the scores are low, uh, that indicates that person has normal hearing. They could hear everything that's on the graph below that red line. So they could hear water dripping, dogs barking, a motorcycle. The light blue shaded area shows normal level conversational speech. So that person would be able to hear all of normal level conversational speech. The next graph shows hearing loss. And if you'll notice, it slants downward in the higher pitches. And this person would have difficulty hearing certain sounds like P, H, G, T, H. So just like Dr. White mentioned, they would have difficulty telling uh, one word from another, like ball from fall. They are hearing some of the softer sounds, but not the louder sounds that help them understand speech. These people would say, well, I can hear someone talking, but I'm not understanding them. 